Okay, everyone, what's up? Goldie here, and I'm going to be going over the big 12-game main slate that we have here on uh, Friday, May 26. A um, lot of arms, of course, and uh, a pretty decent balance. I think there's some very attackable spots. Certainly, we have another uh, Coors slate with the Mets flying into Colorado. Um Scherzer on the mound there is very interesting, very cheap price tag for Scherzer. Um, but we've got plenty of other spots that we can attack as well. I think the the Mets getting uh, Connor Siebold here tonight, they're going to once again garner a lot of ownership. It, and, and it's probably a little bit outsized to you know all of the other teams' relative... Um, you know, probably or probable upside to get there for you on a 12 game slate, if that makes sense. Um, basically, the Mets are probably going to be a little bit over owned relative to teams that are in some um, pretty good spots themselves. Houston uh, is kind of jumps out, um, Atlanta and Philly, maybe a little bit, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The Padres for sure, they get a major league debut, um, et cetera. So we don't have to necessarily eat a lot of ownership on the Mets tonight, uh, certainly in, in shorter tournaments like single entry, three max, 20 max even. I mean, you're going to want to get exposure where you can, of course, as as you normally are want to do uh, pretty much on any size slate with a Coors, Coors game. But plenty of other very high upside teams, Toronto in a super sneaky spot against a Louis Varland, I think, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that said, we've got uh, projections and ownership here loaded to the site. Um, keep an eye out for all of this throughout the day. We'll have pushes as lineups start to trickle in. Things will change. Most of the arms we want to stick with are probably going to be in the upper range today, but there are a couple of playable spots down here that we might be able to consider kind of throw up spots. <laughs> Um, you know, like a, like an Alex Wood. I mean, he gets a hell of a good matchup down here. It, it I don't know. It's it. We're not we're not super thrilled about coming down to this sub seven k range today. Um, I think the lowest we might really be okay with going is maybe here in our first game with a Joe Musgrove at seventy five hundred. Padres and the Yankees. Um, in Yankee Stadium, Musgrove here. I think it's a very playable price for him. Now, most of last year we were playing, you know, mid 9Ks, even north of 10K in some matchups. He struggled a little bit here out of the gate. Uh, one of his starts was in Mexico City where he just gave up seven earned runs and like three and a third or something like that. So we could basically throw that out. Now, it's going to contribute to the numbers here, of course, um, but that is such an outlier start that... Yeah, at that type of elevation, it's nearly, what, 40%, 60% higher elevation than Coors Field. You know, so um, it was at like 7,300 feet or something like that. So we could throw, we could throw that out. Um, and he still only got five starts because he started the season a little bit late, had like a busted toe or something. Um, I think Musgrove, he's kind of frustrating sometimes because I think he really should be a lot better than he is. Uh, we'd like him to be, but um, yeah, the upside is still in the tank for him, and we can't really take much of anything out of these numbers. Like, he's got a 4-0 homer per 9 to the right side of the plate. Well, it's 39 hitters. Um, you know, we can't really take a lot out of that, and once again, a lot of that, a lot of all this production to righties and to lefties, it came in that uh, that Mexico City start. So, we don't really want to put too much stock into any of these numbers. He's about a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy himself, and he's got a very diverse arsenal, full six pitches that he uses. Um, the numbers that will have converged so far, yeah, a little bit of the strikeout rate, but once again, we got one start here that we just you know, totally throw out. The barrel rate, yeah, a little bit, but um, you know, a lot of his breaking stuff, like the curveball slider, notably, we're not going to move pretty much at all in Mexico City. So 
hard to really gauge there as well. But the chase, eh, a little bit because, um, you know, the, again, the, the breaking stuff, not super breakable, <laughs> so to speak, um, at such high elevations here. So the, the strike one rate, definitely, that will converge. And we can take a little bit more out of the swing strike rate and the CSW. Uh, the CSW, given the underlying shenanigans, still at 27%. I think it's okay. Whip high. And as we can see here, just in raw suppression, 675 ERA with expected metrics, a full two and two and a half runs lower than that. Right? So the strand rate is going to come up at 66%. This is very low for Musgrove. So I think this is a playable spot for him at a playable price tag. We'd like to see the projection pop up a little bit higher. But I think this is very playable, and he's sub-10% owned here at Yankee Stadium. He has enough stuff in the tank uh, to even get through the Yankees here. Um, and I think he's likely to get a little bit of run support because the Yankees get are having uh, – they've got Randy Vasquez going for them um, tonight. He's making his debut, and uh, let's see. I had him over here on the other on the other page, but I lost it. Um, he's making his debut tonight, taking the spot of Domingo Hermont, who is a perpetual uh, sticky stuff user. Uh, he'll probably be back his next turn in the rotation, so we've likely only got just the one here to to deal with here with Randy Vasquez. Um, in AAA this year, it's he got his first taste of, of AAA this season. He's got 42 and two-thirds innings. He's got a 10.5K per nine with a 25.5% strikeout rate. That's encouraging. 11.5 or 12% walk rate, not so encouraging. Um, but the batted ball metrics are pretty decent, about a 38% stat cast hard hit rate. That's better than Musgrove has displayed so far this season, as a matter of fact. 10.5% swing strike rate and all that, not all that impressive. High homer to fly ball rate and about a 1.5 ground ball to fly ball rate. However... A lot of line drives at a full 24% here in the upper minors this season. He's got about a 4.6 xFIP with a 4.85 ERA. So nothing overly impressive here. Um, let's see, pitch mix wise, let's go. Uh, we're actually not going to have any of that uh, over here on Fangraphs from his stuff up in the minors. So. Uh, just a spot start and very likely to only go a couple of innings here. And I think we can get to the Potter. It's a bad matchup. So even at 4,000, I'm not sure that we could really consider playing him. Um, a bad strikeout matchup generally because the Padres are starting to heat up. Tatis, Cronenworth a little bit. They got him back up in the two uh, while Machado is still out. Juan Soto and Xander Bogarts. They've Now, Bogarts has cooled off significantly since his early season barrage, but Soto is heating up. Tatis getting into the swing of things a little bit more. In aggregate, very attackable are the Padres. Overall, with 24.5% strikeout rate, 91 WRC+. Plus. This team just does not create. It's because everybody down at the bottom of the lineup is terrible. Uh, Austin Nola has been a corpse. He had, what, one good season, I guess? Um, and he's been bad ever since, you know, he got, he got moved over to Seattle. Um, Trent Grisham is terrible. Brandon Dixon has really never taken off, uh, so he's getting a lot of playing time, and they're platooning he and Grisham now. Uh, Rune Odor, he's actually been most of their offense over the last week. He's at a playable 2,700 here in Yankee Stadium. You want to play the, the Rugi and the Matt Carpenter revenge narrative? Uh, sure, go ahead. Matt Carp is a very playable first and third base eligibility now at 3,000 flat. He's going to hit a lot of fly balls, and... As I mentioned, the, the line drive rate for Vasquez so far, 25 24% so far in the upper minors this year. I think we we're, we're going to want line drive hitters from the left side in particular. Now, full stacks with the Padres here, yeah, you can make it happen definitely because if Vasquez gets blown apart, Yankee bullpen still going to have a little bit of trouble managing that. But the... The Yankee bullpen has overall been pretty respectable this season. Um, some of the best numbers split adjusted. So they're still pretty good on the back end over here, even though they've had to kind of piece things together and eat some innings uh, with the health of their starting rotation kind of questionable. 
so overall, we got to side with the Padres, and I like some Musgrove here for sure. You can always play the Yankees. You got a pretty curious price tag over here. You got DJ LeMahieu at 2600 at third base today. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> like, I, I actually did look, and we haven't had him that cheap in the last eight years. Um, so this is, this is kind of an anomaly. I know he's striking out a lot this year. His walk rate is down. Strikeout rate is about double his career averages. But the rest of the batted ball metrics, he's hitting the ball harder than he has in pretty much his entire career. And everything else is, is pretty much in line. It's just that'll just be a timing issue when the strikeout rate is so high and the walk rate is down. He's just not seeing the baseball. He has dealt with the injuries, of course, so he's not been in the lineup every single day to really get him going and get him into a good rhythm. And DJ is the kind of hitter, makes so much contact that he really needs his timing down uh, in order to see the power numbers come up. In any case, he's 2,600 to third base, and that's a very playable price. So if you want to go after the variance with Musgrove, he undoubtedly just hasn't been good in his in his other four starts outside of the Mexico City start this season. So you can still attack this because there's variance with Musgrove. When he's bad, he get, can get really, really bad. And this is also a Yankee Stadium. So at just a general neutral ground ball to fly ball for Musgrove, you can very much attack that uh, with the Yankees as well. Judge always. Rizzo is fine. Uh, DJ, of course, as I mentioned, at 2,600. You can play Bader. You can play Bowers. Uh, Volpe at 4,000, kind of not my favorite here, but Glaber's seeing beach balls right now. Um, and it, he's really, really seeing the baseball. At 4,900, not my favorite price tag to go after Musgrove with him here, but uh, it's okay if you want to get some really off-the-board Yankee stacks. Kind of middling so far in value and ownership, and it's mostly popping the value score because DJ is so cheap. So uh, I think playable Yankees, mostly just the Padres and some Musgrove there. I, I think 75 is attackable. Okay, let's move on. Texas and Baltimore. John Gray on the mound. I don't really want to do this against Baltimore. This is a very hard team to attack in general um, with guys that just don't have raw whiff stuff. And even though in his last three starts, John Gray has been very good. The K stuff is still leaving it on the table a little bit. Um, just at aggregate, 18.5%. Now, he was terrible in his first, like, six six starts, I think. His last three have been very good. Um, he spiked pretty hard down at about 7,700, 7, I believe it was. Um, three starts ago. I'm trying to pull it up here over on the other monitor, and I've lost him. Uh, there he is. Um, so the price tag... Yeah, he was 77, dropped to 68 against Oakland. That's a really good matchup, but he only struck out five there when he went a full eight innings, uh, which is obviously encouraging. And he's also had Colorado to attack as well at home. Um, so a little bit of you know variance still here with John Gray, and that's because the four-seamer has not been good. He's really, really increased the slider value, and that's what he's um, realized all of the upside with. In the last three starts, changeup still been okay for him, despite the fact that the four seamer has been bad. He's spraying it a little bit still here with the four seamer and having trouble controlling it. But overall, I think he's pointed in the right direction. I don't want to play him here at this particular price tag in this particular matchup. Um, I think it's very reasonable to get to a little bit of the Orioles here tonight. They sat Cedric Mullins last night. Super frustrating. Um, even though, it, like, it was a personal issue, so I, I guess I, it was only frustrating because he had a fantastic matchup against Clark Schmidt. Um, they didn't really do a whole lot, but he didn't really do a whole hell of a lot either. Um, I really like a lot of these lefties from the O's in very attackable spots against guys that historically have had problems with left-handed hitters, and John Gray certainly qualifies in that regard. Um, the batted ball metrics for John here are are all pretty damn good so far. Now, he's giving up a huge, huge line drive rate in a pretty respectable sample. 100-plus hitters to the left side here, so that's why why I would like to get to some of the Orioles here tonight if I can. Some, Cedric is down to 55. We'll see if he's back in the lineup tonight. Uh, Rutch is going through a little bit of a, a cold streak right now, really from both sides. Not seeing the baseball as well. He's 5,000. He's fine. You can still play him. Um, Santander at 42, I, 
almost prefer him from the right side, but it, it he's fine from the left side as well. Mountcastle is fine to throw in into it stacks as well because the strikeout rate really to both sides here is not going to make him you know look really terrible in a batter's box from John Gray. So uh, 4,500 for Mountcastle, that's fine. Adam Frazier still is fine as well, as is Gunner. So I think some Oriole stacks are, are kind of sneaky and, and a little bit off the board here. But very, very much playable, kind of popping in the same range as the Yankees in value and ownership so far. Um, I would really love to play some Grayson Rodriguez on the other side. This changeup is just an elite pitch, man. It is so, so good. But I think we we might have a little bit of trouble here. Uh, he's having trouble throwing strikes and, and getting ahead of, of hitters in counts. And it's ballooning the walk rate a little bit. The chase, despite a really good change and a pretty decent slider as well, it's just not been there just yet. It's only got a 10.5% swing strike rate. The raw strikeout rate is, is good, right, to both sides of the plate here in about 200 hitter sample. Uh, 26% in aggregate. So that's that's good. His called strikes are are fine and, and keeping the CSW up near 27%, which is okay. I think the suppression here has been has gotten a little carried away to the downside for him. He's got a 620 ERA here with expected metrics far lower. XERA just a run lower, but the XFIP is two and a half runs lower. So um, it's really because of the walks and, and situational sort of sequencing for him and not being able to throw strikes in counts when he needs it. So he's gotten onto the barrel a little bit because he's got to throw things kind of over the middle of the plate because he gets behind, right? And he can't really work to the very plus changeup that he's got. Like, look at this velo delta on the change to the the four-seamer, a full 13 miles an hour. That's insane. So this is a fantastic pitch for him as long as he can start spotting the four-seamer, allowing him to work to the changeup more. That'll give him even more swing and miss, and it'll drop the walk rate, increase the strike one rate, of course, and when he's able to throw his breaking stuff in more favorable counts, that will increase the chase rate as well. So uh, overall, I think it's just kind of early season, early career um, noise, I guess, and not so much noise in the numbers, but noise in the results, I guess. Uh, for Grayson, he's gotten picked apart by a couple of bad teams, for example, like the Tigers, notably. Um, I would really like to play him. I think 8,300 is a, is a playable price tag. Not in this not in this matchup necessarily, though. Texas is very dangerous, man. Um, we need him to be able to spot this four seamer, and he's not been able to work to it or work off of it and work to the the very plus change here. And Texas is still one of the best teams in baseball against right-handed pitching. They got their best hitter back with Corey Seager up at the top of the lineup still. Now, they're very expensive, at least the guys you want to play, Semyon Seager and Adelis Garcia. Uh, Josh Young's 4,800. He's kind of stiff here. Don't really want to do that. Um, so you got to deal with a little bit of variance, I think, in playing some Grayson here. at a playable price tag, but it's a very difficult matchup, and... I think 10% is okay. He was coming in higher earlier this morning with a, a, a higher projection as well. Um, and these are starting to come down a little bit, which I think makes sense. I'm not sure I want to get crazy with the Grayson here, but I do like getting to him if I can. Um, and maybe in some correlated stacks as well. But I think playing some off-the-board Texas is very well within range and attacking some of this. Uh, you know, he's still a young arm here. Despite having a good pitch, he's got some vulnerabilities. Okay, let's move on to St. Louis and Cleveland. Uh, Matt Liebertor, I, uh, he's just a contact pitcher, and I would like to play slightly above average arms against Cleveland because this offense is just horrendous. They are so, so bad. They cannot create any any run scoring whatsoever. Uh, they've got guys with speed, but they just can't get on base, man. 278 Woba is terrible. 19% strikeout rate, yeah, it's like whatever, but it doesn't matter when you're making soft and medium contact only. There's just no hard contact coming from them at all. 121 ISO, and they hit everything on the ground. Uh, 75 WRC plus is just awful, and it's to both sides on the mound here. I would like to play Libertor, so is, is he in play because his offense is so bad? Yeah, I guess. 
7100 I like it if he were a little bit cheaper here. Um, does he have a full six inning upside in him with zero or, you know, with full suppression and, and zero production allowed, I suppose? Uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, I'm, I don't know. I don't, it's very hard for me to play pitchers against Cleveland on full slates unless they've got some pretty good stuff, suppression upside and K stuff. And I'm not sure Libertor really has that. He's a, he's a contact pitcher and I don't really want to deal with that against Cleveland, even though it's not going to be very good contact. Um, so I'm kind of off Libertor here. I'm also kind of off of Bieber. 9200 I don't like the price tag. And it's mostly because the, the strikeout stuff is totally gone. Uh, not really sure what's going on with Bieber this year. He's not burying the slider enough. Cutter's not necessarily a whiff pitch, but he's throwing it a little bit more this season, and it, it's really kind of sapped the strikeout stuff for him. Pitching to more contact, full 78% here for Bieber, despite the fact that his entire career he's always thrown strikes and always had an elite walk rate. The contact rate has never been this high because the strikeout stuff has been far higher. Um, so it's a little concerning and hard to play him anymore because the strikeouts, it's just not there. We're talking a full six ticks lower to the right side of the plate than it has been in the past and a full four and five ticks lower to the lefties. Um, now he's always been much better against left-handers in terms of suppression than he has been against righties, and that's because he buries this slider sort of in on the hands, and he throws it a little bit more for a strike. And he gets a lot of swing and miss on it in that regard. But, um, yeah, it's really hard to play him at a 9K. I think there's plenty of other guys that we can get to, and he's got a horrible matchup here. Like, there's several other players or pitchers in the 9K range today that I think we'd rather get to that don't have to go after the Cardinals. Uh, this is still a very hot offense, even though the Reds kind of suppress them a little bit. They still won two or three in that series and put up 10 runs once, you know, so it's not like they're like super cold. Um, you know, they're not Cleveland, for example. So if you want to go after some Shane Bieber here, I think they're a very off the board stack St. Louis. Uh, I love Bieber and I hate stacking against him in general. But this is not the sh same Shane Bieber, and he's pitching to a lot more contact. The suppression is still there a little bit, but he's got a 3-0 ERA with expected metrics, a full run, and even two runs higher. Strand rate is pretty high here still at 81%. I think we might see a little bit of suppression regression come to him uh, to the downside. So I'm not crazy about this price tag here. I do like the projection, of course, and I like the ownership. Yeah. He's a fine tournament pivot, um, but I don't think he's going to be able to strike out many guys here tonight because the Cardinals are only at a 21% aggregate K rate themselves, 111 WRC+, plus, 36% hard contact against righties, very difficult team and offense to go after. So um, I'm mostly on the Cardinals here because Cleveland is just dreadful, top to bottom. Um, you know, Bieber's a, still a very good arm, but I don't think you can play him here tonight. It's a very, very difficult spot. Maybe some Libertor, I guess, but like, ugh. Okay, Philly and Atlanta. Taiwan Walker, I don't think we can play this either. I would like to get to some Atlanta here tonight. They're going to come in, you know, top five in value so far, but, you know, maybe outside the top five in ownership. Uh, so that's encouraging. That's how we want to attack with the Braves. Of course, last night they got off their uh, totally washed Aaron Nola um, with Austin Riley mostly. He's He had two bombs. But uh, Marcelo Zuna is uh, evidently a good hitter again uh, when he's not rolling over ground balls. He's never really had a high strikeout rate, so he's made contact. And when he gets going, he he can get pretty streaky. He's been very good. He got into Nola last night as well. You still have to pay for the Braves, um, but I'm really okay paying for them tonight because most of their hitters, or most of their good hitters, their power hitters at least, are hitting from the right side, and Taiwan Walker's only got an 18% K rate to the right side this season. He has a very high soft contact rate. It's equal to his hard contact rate, which is kind of concerning in that regard. But um, he's got a very high walk rate to the lefties. So if he's just going to put Matt Olson and Eddie Rosario, Ozzy Albies on base, that plays into the hands of the right-handers here for Atlanta to 
eke out some production and drive in some runs. Um, So despite the fact that Atlanta is an underwhelming offense against right-handed pitching, in general, they're still very dangerous here. And if you can't get after them with raw strikeout stuff, uh, they're still get, they're, that means they're going to hit for a lot of power and a lot of hard contact, get the baseball in the air, and hit it over the wall. And it's even the guys down at the bottom of the of the lineup. Uh, Orlando Arcia has been very decent this season as well. So there's plenty of cheaper pieces that'll make full brave stacks happen for us. Uh, and I would like to to get after that. Even though Taiwan Waters got a really really good split here. He's having trouble with the walks and controlling it and aggregate at just the 21% K rate. So I'm not crazy about the lefties here. They're going to walk more and they're going to strike out more. Um, he will give up a little bit more pop to them and some more hard contact. So that's fine. Mix in Matt Olson and an Eddie and an Albies or, or whoever they've got. Uh, that's fine to play in stacks. And I think, but I think in full stacks, it plays into the Braves' hands a little bit more to have more righties in the lineup in this particular matchup than lefties. Jared Schuster on the mound for the Braves, 6,100 for him. Um, pretty difficult spot. Popping pretty hard down here at a near 13-point projection for somebody at 6,100. This is a difficult matchup, man. Even though the lefties, uh, or the Phillies, rather, against lefties, have been pretty underwhelming so far this season. I mean, Kyle Schwarber is just a corpse. He's hitting 200, striking out at a just an astronomical clip against both sides of the plate. He is a true three outcome or a three true outcome hitter uh, anymore, uh, and and really Trey's been pretty underwhelming. Nick Castellanos hits righties better over his last 800 PAs than he does lefties. JTR really not taken off quite yet. Really the only good hitters, excellent hitters against left-handed pitching so far, have been Alec Bohm and like Edmundo Sosa to be quite honest. Uh, so they've been very underwhelming against lefties. That's why I think Schuster is in play down here at 6,100. Uh, a very difficult matchup because I don't want to go after Trey Turner and Bryce Harper, even Castellanos. It's not like he's bad against lefties. He's just better against righties. Um, or, I mean, I'm fine playing pretty much anybody against Kyle Schwarber right now. He's expensive and he's striking out, you know, at a ridiculous clip. Um, JTR is hard to get through, right? Because he makes a, a good bit of contact, doesn't strike out a lot himself. So it's kind of a difficult matchup here. We saw what they they did to uh, Dylan Dodd last night. Just kind of a, a middle-of-the-road type of lefty. I think Schuster is a little bit better, right? But he's still not, in a short sample, admittedly, not throwing it past enough people for me to get overly excited about it down here. Um, he is. Mo- this is mostly just like a suppression and a price tag play hoping he pops for 18 to 20 points, which I think is reasonable. On a full 12-game slate, though, you might need a little bit more out of out of your starters tonight uh, than just 18 or 20 on the mound. So he's walking some guys, some righties in particular, and we don't really want to be putting ba- guys on base for free. They've got a lot of power hitters over here, um, and if you're walking people, like this could turn into a real crooked inning pretty quickly. So uh, not super interested in, in Schuster. But I think he's in play at the price tag and, and the projection if, and at low ownership as well. You can play correlated Brave stacks targeting some Taiwan Walker. So I like Atlanta a little bit here tonight. Um, just 3-2 to two in the betting market at uh, at $1.50. And I think that's very playable targeting some Taiwan Walker here. Okay, San Francisco and Milwaukee. Let's try and speed things up here a little bit. Alex Wood, he's also popping a little bit down here at uh, in the low 6K. 6300 for him. Problem is I'm not sure he's going to go more than four innings. Uh, I've got more confidence, and I think I'd rather play Schuster because, you know, if he's rolling, I think he's got more upside to to go a little bit deeper. Like the Giants, they just do so much garbage with the matchups. They do it with the pitchers. They do it with the um, with their hitters. They just play matchups. They try to be Tampa, and they're not Tampa. Their their analytics are not as good. They try way too hard to capitalize on. Uh, super, super tiny edges, and it kind of is, is a little bit to their detriment sometimes. Um, and they do that with Alex Wood. Even though he's not all that impressive, he needs to be a starter, and he needs to go, you know, he needs to start traditionally, and they need to just let him run. I'm not sure he's fully stretched out. You know, he's not an, he doesn't have an overly impressive arsenal. Um, and he's kind of struggling to find it because they just won't let him go. So they've had him come out of the bullpen a little bit, and, you know, in any case, um, I don't think he's fully stretched out here, so I don't think we could play him. I'd rather just play Schuster. 
despite a, a <clears throat> excuse me, an attractive projection here at uh, you know a full 13 points, a very low ownership himself. Um, I think he might only make it four, four and two thirds here, despite a very, very good matchup against the Brewers. They're horrible, man, the, against lefties. I'm still expecting this team to turn it around a little bit against the left side. Uh, or against lefties on the mound, that is. Owen Miller and Willie Contreras have really been the only two plus pieces for them. Owen Miller's having a fantastic month in, at the plate. Uh, he's been great. His price has finally come up. He's third base and eligible, third base and outfield eligible now, rather. Um, lost his second base, so that kind of stinks. But uh, gaining the outfield eligibility makes him just as playable. He's 2900 now, but still a very playable price tag. You can go after some Alex Wood. And you can play Willie behind the plate. I think that's fine. You can play Willie Adamas at shortstop at 39. He's still at a playable uh, price tag there. Darren Ruff, he's 2,200. He's got pop against lefties, definitely. Brian Anderson has pop. All these guys are going to strike out, though. And even Yelich, who's been probably their best hitter, most consistent hitter, he's going to hit from the left side. And Alex Wood's always been pretty damn good against lefties. And Yelich still strikes out and hits a lot of ground balls. So don't really want to be playing him. So it's probably just short stacks. If I'm getting to some of the Brewers, I'm still counting on them to not be this atrocious all season. But uh, I don't know. Maybe at some point I just got to accept it. Um, so I'd like to play some of the Brewers, notably just the top of the, the guys at the top of the lineup, Owen Miller, Willie Contreras, and Willie Adamas. Maybe a Darren Ruff. I don't want to play him at first base, though, even if he is 2,200. Freddie Peralta on the mound. He's going to see a little bit of ownership here tonight. 8,800. I think it's probably warranted. But we're seeing the walk problem start to creep back up again for Freddie. Full 10% this season. And this was far lower last year. It's about double what it was. So we, he's got some worries. He's still trying to find it a little bit. Um, losing value on his very good breaking stuff historically with the slider curveball so far. And the changeup's really not been all that great either. It, it It's not necessarily velo on the four-seamer. He's always had a pretty good four-seamer. It's just control. And if he's not getting any value out of the breaking stuff, that's going to make him more attackable. So with the Giants here at a full 25% ownership that Freddie's seeing, I think he's playable. Don't get me wrong. I like the price tag. Of course, he's popping very hard in the projection here, and the Giants are bad, right? Like I said, they did, they play these matchups here, um, and a lot of their guys just can't get into rhythm. Now, they're doing it a little bit less in the batter's box this season, more so on the mound, um, but they're giving Lamont Wade a little bit of run. They're letting him hit a, a little bit more against lefties. Tyro's in there every day. Michael Conforto, J.D. Davis, Yaz. They're mostly in there every single day. Uh, Haniger as well, they're they're playing around a little bit down at the bottom of the lineup, but most teams do that. Um, so we'll see if like a, a Blake Sable's in the list tonight. I'd like him. He's a high fly ball hitter. Um, he'd be a good sort of leverage piece. I don't particularly want to stack San Francisco. They're going to strike out a lot, man. 25% aggregate K rate, 10% walk rate. That's great. 34% hard contact rate. Yeah, it's great. So I think this is a little bit dangerous here to be clicking in a full 50% of Freddie Peralta or something like that to get leverage on the field here. It's a good spot for strikeout stuff, yeah. But if he's going to walk people, they got some power hitters over here, man. And this is, this is dangerous. He gives up a lot of fly balls to the right side of the plate. And he's just neutral for all intents and purposes against the left side. High, high line drive rate here to both sides. 24% in aggregate. And the Giants over here, they're going to be able to hit the baseball in the air and on a line with some hard contact. So uh, I think this is a pretty intriguing deep tournament stack here for some leverage off of Freddy Peralta. I'm going to have some Freddy. Yeah, don't get me wrong, because the Giants are still pretty bad and very attackable. But I think you could play some Giants here. Uh, this walk rate is worrisome. If you put people on base, this could turn into a, a crooked number uh, very quickly against Freddie, and he's got the strikeout stuff to get out of that, sure, in this particular matchup, definitely. So I'd side with Freddie, but I think Giants are playable. Um, as are a couple of Milwaukee pieces, I don't really want to deal with the Alex Wood shenanigans. I'd rather just uh, make a pivot to Schuster or something. Okay, so let's move on to Kevin Gosman and Louis Varland, uh, Toronto and Minnesota. Gosman, yeah, sure. He's getting the most ownership, though, and he's the most expensive arm. Um now, he's at a 22-point median projection here. It's a real big number, I would say. But I got no problems with the projection, really. 
Uh, it's a little high. I have a little, I take a little bit more of an issue with, um, with, with the ownership here, full 35%. I think that makes for a pretty interesting tournament pivot with a guy who we'll get to later. Um, 32% aggregate K rate here, high strike one rate, high chase as always with Gosman, high swinging strike rate, high CSW. We'd like to see a few more called strikes out of him, but the chase is so high that we don't really care. Strand rate is actually kind of low for Gosman, to be quite honest. You could probably see this tick up. Suppression metrics at a 3.0 ERA, right in line with his expected. Buck 08 whip, it's all great. Barrel rate's great, walk rate's great, as it always is with Gosman. I don't see anything wrong here. Outside of, you know, some negative slider values, you need to throw this a little bit more. But if he's establishing with the four-seamer and can work to the split whenever he wants to and get chase and swing and miss there, uh, he didn't really need a third pitch. Um, that said, you know, if you're going to throw this at 8% of the time, it, it better be giving you more value than this. So that is a weakness. Um but I don't really want to go after him with any of the Twins. Twins are kind of bad here. They're missing Carlos Correa. He's got like a heel bruise or I think it was plantar fasciitis or something like that. Uh, so that's going to decrease their upside, even though he hadn't really gotten going yet. And some of their lefties, well, they're all going to strike out a lot here. So I definitely am going to side with Gosman. Um, but you don't have to play this. Because the Twins are still an average offense and, well, slightly above average offense against right-handed pitching. They're going to strike out, yes, but they're going to hit for a little bit of power still. And they've got some lefties over here that can make it a little bit difficult on Gosman. I'm not really worried about it, though. So I like Gosman a, a pretty good bit, and, um, you know, the field will, too. We're just really just going to have to balance constructions with him at a full 10-3 and 35-plus percent ownership. Louis Varlin on the mound. He's got some strikeout stuff in the tank. Um, a little less so to, I mean, this is pretty noisy here. 33% in 39 hitters. That's, well, that's quite a bit. That's 13 Ks. Um, but a very short sample against the left, the left side of the plate so far this season. Um, everything's pretty okay though. The control is good. The strike one is good. The chase is good. Swing strikes are good. I think this makes him attackable in plus matchups. I don't think this is a plus matchup, however. He's getting on the barrel a little bit and giving up a boatload of hard contact in a, in a larger sample to the right side here. Uh, that's going to make him very susceptible. He's got a 247 average allowed to the righties so far, which is fine. 351 Woba, though, is a pretty big number, and a 274 ISO is a huge number. So we're seeing 2.8 homers per nine. That's noisy, certainly, in just a 19-inning sample against righties. But 42% hard contact, probably a little less noisy. So I think that's attackable here with some Toronto. Probably not a favorite stack, I don't think, but very attackable for sure. They're not going to strike out a lot, just 21% themselves. And as we saw, a little bit lower strikeout rate for Louis, just 23% here uh, against the right side. 113 WRC plus in aggregate and some hard contact. Not as much power as we'd like to see, but I think they might be starting to turn it around a little bit. George Springer starting to heat up and see the baseball a little bit at the top of the lineup. Unfortunately, after his one dinger day, he's up to 4,800. Bo Bichette down to 51. I like this uh, a lot better. He's not 58 or whatever he was at the beginning of the year. Vladdy's still at 54 and expensive there, but he's a high contact hitter. He hasn't really gotten going either. Uh, certainly not power-wise. Um, just yet this season. Brandon Belt's okay at 25. If you pivot off of Vladdy, it's fine. Matt Chapman down to 46. Starting to like this a little bit as well. Witt has been fine. So, and, and Dalton Varsho really has not, but uh, he is a playable left-handed piece. They've had to move him down to the seven just because he's been horrible. Um, this is kind of what we get with Varsho, right? A lot of variant streaky hitter uh, he'll be. So 3,800, it's a fine and playable piece. They're working with their catchers here, Ali Kirk in particular, trying to hit the baseball in the air a little bit more. Just too many damn ground balls. But uh, so kind of a difficult and frustrating offense to play generally. I'd like to just stick to the top of the lineup here, but I think it's an attack spot against Louis Varland. I don't want to play him at 8,500. I think he's overpriced here. Um, you know, despite a throwing the slider a lot, and Toronto is very attackable with good sliders, kind of leaving it on the table here with the four-seamer and the change. Um, mostly just an average arsenal so far here, and I'm not super thrilled about uh, such heavy four-seamer slider um, usage. 
and just a 15 percent of uh of the change when you know the the toronto is, is going to hit the baseball on the line and in the air with some hard contact here and that's going to give louis a little bit of a fly ball lean so uh i'm gonna side with gosman in toronto here for sure probably just staying off of most of minnesota even at uh, at target field but it's warm there tonight you can see the baseball fly a little bit. Uh, okay, let's move on. Washington, Kansas City. I think we're going to get to some offense here tonight. Um, I'm less so on the Royals. We'll get to that in a second. I kind of like Patty Corbin and the changes he's made this year. I'm not going to play him. No, don't get me wrong. Um, I don't think this is the matchup to be playing Patrick Corbin. The Royals against left-handed pitching are actually a lot better than they are against right-handers. They don't strike out nearly as much below average or above average, I guess. 103 WRC plus they create much better against lefties than they do against righties because you see in aggregate even with a 500 PA sample included in this 880 PA sample against everybody they're down at 82 WRC plus right that includes the WRC plus of the lefties here so they are horrendous against right handers striking out a full three per three percent higher two and a half percent right against um against righties, it's even 3 and 4% higher because, as I said, this does include these numbers here. So against lefties, they're much better. They hit the baseball in an 080 ground ball to fly ball here. They get it in the air with a lot of hard contact, 35% in aggregate. It's a very strong number. Not as much power that you'd expect out of those two figures or given those two figures, but it's there. So I think this is an attackable spot against Patty. He's been far better, though, against righties this season certainly in in the power allowed and the homers allowed some of the production is still there they're still going to hit for some average of course but not so much in iso right he's, he's not striking them out which is why i don't think we can play him here but he's been much much better this year he's dialing in this slider again and we mentioned in his last couple of starts this was the pitch that got him this huge contract in washington so he's dialing this in it's still throwing a two seamer he needs to get rid of this damn pitch and that will suppress a lot of the contact and most of the power to the right side of the plate. But overall, it's been very encouraging to see Patrick Corbin kind of come back to life here a little bit. I don't think that uh, getting to full Royal stacks is really all that warranted here tonight, um, even though he's going to pitch to a lot of average. Don't get me wrong. Like, I'm not I'm not jacked about going out going after just average hard contact um, here with the Royals. That said, I, I do think you can play them. Of course, you can play Salve. You can play Bobby Witt. But Bobby Witt isn't even popping so far as one of the top five value plays on the Royals, right? It's the other guys. It's Eddie Olivares. It's um, it's Michael Garcia. It's Salvi, et cetera, et cetera. It's not even Bobby Witt because he's 5,500. Hard to get there with him. So because of the, price to, the pricing for the Royals, I'm not jacked about 49 for Salvi in this particular spot. Um, not going to strike out a lot necessarily, so it's fine in that regard. Same thing with Bobby Witt. But I'd rather get to some of the other guys if I'm playing some of the Royals or at least include them in the stacks, you know. So I'm not as bullish on the Royals tonight as maybe the betting markets would be. I'm more bullish on Washington going after Jordan Lyles. I want to do this for sure. And I think they'll probably be, I mean, they're going to pop up in the top three probably, certainly for value because every damn one of them is still very cheap outside of Lane Thomas, who's only 4,200. Um we can, we can get to all of the Royals, or excuse me, all of the Nationals, um, because in value and ownership, they're going to pop in the top five for us. And I think that's uh, pretty warranted to go after Jordan Lyles here. Even at 6,600, I don't want to play this um, against a pretty bad offense. They don't strike out at all. They don't create and hit for a lot of power. So we got to manage our ownerships and be careful that we're not getting too heavy exposures to Washington, but I love getting to Jamer in this particular spot. He's been great from the left side this year. 3,400, I think that's fine. Joey Manessis at 31, really starting to heat up a little bit, I think, is Manessis. Starting to see the baseball a little bit more. Corey Dickerson from the left side, 2,300. This is a damn good play, I think, uh, here tonight. Caber behind the plate. He's 38, not super stoked about that. But you can play a lot of these lefties. Luis Garcia at second base, you can play at 3,800, too. So very stackable are, are the Nationals here in short stacks, full stacks, one-offs. You can do pretty much whatever you want, I think. Um, all these guys are very much playable and and, and and within range here tonight against Jordan Lyles. He's just giving up power to everybody. 271 to the lefties, 280, uh, excuse me, 293 ISO to the righties. 
homer numbers, hard contact numbers, no soft contact, boatload of fly balls, and it's 75 and 80 degrees in Kansas City tonight. So, yeah, let's do it. Okay, let's move on. The Mets in Colorado. Scherzer on the mound for the Mets. 9,200 for him. Uh, yikes, man. I'm still not convinced Scherzer is totally um, totally fixed yet, whether it's the neck or the oblique or the finger or he's going to cheat or, or whatever he's going to do. Um, I'm just not interested in, in playing him. I don't want to deal with this. It, he's a fly ball pitcher, and he's got a homer problem. He's always had a homer problem. Um, and that's really plaguing him once again this year. He's given up a homer per start nearly, right? So he's a stone lock pretty much every damn start for one bomb. I don't know who it's going to come against. I mean, this year, in his very short sample, let's come to the righties a little bit more. Historically, it's mostly to the lefties. He gives up more pop and more power and, and fly balls to the left side. But, I mean, look at his strikeout rate this year. If he's got full seven starts, yeah, he got thrown out. Yeah, yeah, he came out of another one when he was hurt or, you know, whatever. So it's noisy, definitely. But it's only a 22.5%. This should still be higher. Like, to the, to the right side, it's still at, you know, north of 30. That, that number is probably going to persist. The number two, the lefties, is going to come up. Um, the strikeout rate, at least. The walk rate will probably come down. You know, so we got a lot of shenanigans going on in these in these metrics here with Scherzer, but he's still a Coors Field here, and he's still got a homer problem. And even though he's 9,200, the Rockies they're only striking out at a below average clip here, 22% in aggregate themselves. They're not going to create, and Scherzer is good enough to totally negate a lot of this hard contact, but neutral and suspicious line drive rate here for the Rockies. 23% line drives and a buck 10 ground ball to fly ball. That's a pretty respectable uh, batted ball profile. Um, and it's what, and with a depressed strikeout rate for them, it's made them far less attackable than they have been in the past. Don't get me wrong. They're still bad and they don't create. They just lost the one guy that has been stealing bases for them and Brenton Doyle. Um, so we'll have to see what they want to do with the lineup tonight. But, uh, I mean, you can play like a Jerry Profar. I think that's fine. You can play Charlie Blackman. Not jacked about that at 4,900. He's kind of old and kind of washed. Um, their best hitter all season has been Elias Diaz. Chris Bryant's cooled off quite a bit, but he's at a playable 5,000. If you want to play Rocky Stacks and go after some Scherzer here, I don't think this is totally off the board. Um, I don't want to play Scherzer tonight. I mean, look at this median projection, 14 points for Scherzer. This is probably the lowest median projection we've seen from him in, you know, since his, like, early Diamondbacks and Tigers days, you know what I mean? So uh, I don't want to deal with this. A um, couple of these lefties for the Rockies, Mike Boustakis, uh, maybe a Michael Tolia if he's in the lineup tonight. I think these are playable price tags for these guys, and they're playing a Coors Field, Coors Field so I think it's attackable. I don't really want to deal with the Scherzer. Like I said... Like it's Scherzer, you could play him, right? It's fine, and it, at six percent ownership, like this is normally a smash, right? Um, but I don't know. I kind of don't want to play it. I'd rather just pivot to other guys where I'm more confident. Connor Seabold is not one of those guys. He's also 4,200 less expensive, and you know is not Max Scherzer. So there's that. Um, we want to go after the Mets. They've got a seven run total here, uh, which is kind of out of control. Um, I think you just kind of have to come in under on that and just like gulp but oh yeah yeah you're gonna want to get to the Mets tonight they're popping at a full 16 percent aggregate ownership right now that's a high number on a full 12 game slate so you're gonna have to balance that but every damn one of them is good play PD Alonzo up to 5700 well I, he likes hitting a Coors Field he won the home run derby here um you know at Coors so yeah he's 57 though so you got to pay for him 53 for Frankie Lindo is very playable here. Uh, Brett Beatty, 34, very playable. Starling Marte, I like this price for him, even though he's been quite underwhelming this season. 4,300. Danny Vogelbach, 27. Uh, he could hit a total tank shot at Coors here tonight. 27, I, I like that a good bit. Nimmo is fine at 49. Um, this ballpark plays up his skill set quite a bit. Same thing with Jeff McNeil at 39. So pretty much everybody's playable. Frankie Alvarez, definitely. Uh, so you're going to want to get to the Mets. You just got to balance ownership. So try and get to some of these uh, less popular pieces against Connor Siebold. If you want to fade some of the Mets in, in your shorter tournaments, I think that's okay. You don't have to play them because they're going to be so, so popular. And the Rockies' bullpen has been overall pretty good. Connor Siebold, though, he's, he's going to pitch to way too much contact here. And he's not going to throw it past them, and they're not going to strike out. So that's a really good recipe 
um, at Coors Field, right? High, high contact, and that's what we're going to see here. So you just got to balance that. I think you can play some of the Rockies, though, too. Scherzer if you want, but uh, it's kind of a gulp spot. All right, Miami and the Angels. Man, I really want to play Jesus Luzardo. Uh, eh, 9,500 and 5% ownership. This With the 16-point median projection so far, this makes this playable, I think. It's okay in the Sheets foul. Um, it's it's kind of low. You'd like to see this north of 30 for any starting pitchers at this price tag that you're going to attack with. And this is not the greatest matchup against the Angels. 20% aggregate K rate against the lefties. 34% hard contact. Yeah, they've lost Anthony Rendon, but... This is still a, a very potent offense against left-handed pitching. 120 WRC+, plus, 163 ISO, not as high as you'd kind of expect, given the guys that they've got um, you know, from the right side of the plate, in particular Ward, Trout, Renfro, Drury. Gio Urshela's hit lefties well in his career, um, et cetera, et cetera. So eh, it's kind of hard to get there with Luzardo tonight. Some other guys in the 9K range I think I'd rather play, but I really like the ownership, and he's absolutely got the upside here. 26% aggregate K rate. It's very high to both sides. He's really struggling mostly with the right-handers. He's having a little bit of trouble establishing with the four-seamer here. He's throwing his two-seamer and not getting any value with it. Just get rid of the pitch, man. Um, Slider's mostly break even. The velocity is there. That's not really the problem. Changeup's kind of been bad, and that's where he's been getting picked apart against the right side. So I think you could play some angels here tonight at some playable price tags. Taylor Ward, 37. Trout's at 58. It's fine. It's Trout. Uh, you can play Otani, sure, 62. Not my favorite against uh, Luzardo here tonight. Probably stay off that. Rather get to, like, a judge or something like that. Um, or Pete Alonso, if I'm paying that kind of price tag. Hunter Renfro is very playable, 4,300, even though he's been very cold recently. Drury at 39, very playable as well, as are all of the guys at the bottom of the lineup for the Angels. That's fine. I don't really like stacking or going after Luzardo. He has kind of been struggling, though, recently. Um, it really has been not very good in his last kind of seven starts, eight starts nearly. Um, pretty underwhelming so far. I think the upside is still in the tank for him. I yeah, it's a hard, hard matchup here, though. Uh, really kind of a yike spot against the Angels. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to land on this. I would like to get to some because he's got the upside, but uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do it. Not really thrilled about playing the Angels, to be quite honest. Um, I would doubt that I'd land on them. Probably Toronto and, and the Yankees that I would land on. Uh, Baltimore, certainly, instead of them. But um, it's because Trout and Otani are so expensive. You know, so that makes it hard to play them. But uh, I think I think Luzardo's in play. Um, not my favorite to go out of my way. But I think 10% of Luzardo teams, you know, I think those are fine. Reed Detmers, man, I, he's so hard for me to figure out. He should be so much worse than he really is. And, like, in his last outing, he struck out 12, I think, right? Um and I think it was his last out. He's still at a playable 7,700. Yeah, it was his last outing against Minnesota. Went five and two-thirds, struck out 12. Like, what are we doing here? So I don't know how he pulls this out of the tank sometimes, um, but he should be so much worse. And, I, like, I stack, I've stack. i been stacking against him for a year, and he's made me just look stupid. So, um, But, like, tell me why I shouldn't be stacking against him. Is, is it the 380 XFIP? I mean, okay. Is it the very low strand rate? I mean, okay. Um, but he's got a 10% walk rate and a sub-29% chase rate. It's the swinging strike rate that, that really gets him there a lot of the time. But look at these numbers against righties. 43.5% hard contact to the right side of the plate in a 31-inning sample this year. Not so much an average. 237 allowed is, is fine. But a 306 Woba, it's also fine. Just a 102 ISO. Where, how is he giving up this much hard contact in this many fly balls in 078 without giving up power? Like, wh how is he doing this? I don't understand it. So with this much hard contact, I'm looking for regression still. And I still want to stack against three Detmers. Now, do I want to do it with the Marlins? Not really, because they're they're awful. But they strike out far less against lefties. 115 WRC plus and a 400 PA sample against the left side is a huge ballpark upgrade for them. Not so much coming from Coors Field necessarily, but certainly from Miami. Um, 167 ISO, fine hard contact rate, buck 20 ground ball to fly ball with a 21.5% 
line drive rate. It's okay here. They don't walk a lot, which is really frustrating, which makes them kind of hard to get there with in full stacks. But I want to get to some of these power hitters that can get to baseball in the air and over the wall. Uh, and that's notably Georgie Soler, 5,500. He, re- he had a really good series at uh, Coors Field. Uh, John Birdie, I think, is fine at 4,400. He's very playable. Luis Arise down to 4,800. You can play him against everybody. I don't really want to play him at that price tag, however. Um, and we'll see if he's even in, in the lineup. He's been dealing with some nagging stuff. Garrett Cooper's back down to 4,200. You can play that. Brian De La Cruz, you can play this, 37. Don't really want to play Yuli, Gene Segura, Nick Fortes, but you... I absolutely want to play Jonathan Davis. He had a fantastic series at Coors Field. Really good pickup for Miami. Seeing the baseball very well. So I want to play some of these righties here. Probably short stacks like a 9-1-2. Maybe with a Davis, Birdie, Georgie Soler, something like that. I think it's very intriguing. Cool deep tournament stack. Might even be able to get to some of that in like a 20 max or something. I think that's very playable. Um, going after some Reed Detmers. Do you want to play Reed Detmers at 77? I don't particularly. You know, like... Fine medium projection. I don't think I want to get a full 12% of Reed Detmers, though. Um, I think Miami is better against left-handed pitching than they get, really get credit for. So, Okay, let's move on. Houston and Oakland uh, running kind of long here, so let's uh, kind of speed it up. Hunter Brown, well, this is Oakland, and a very high upside righty. We want to play him. Uh, I've been playing him at north at 9K pretty much all season, and I'm certainly not going to stop now. So, yeah, give me as much Hunter Brown as I can get. Um He's going to see lower ownership because of the, all of the ownership coming to Gosman, and I love that. I'd rather try and get overweight here on, on the 20% that Hunter Brown's coming in at right now. I don't really see all that much wrong here. I want to see some more swinging strikes out of him um, you know, as he develops a little bit more. Hopefully it's going to come with the changeup, and he'll get a little bit more out of this, this curveball eventually. Um Hopefully he starts to trust the change and throws it a little bit more, but the four-seamer is great. He's having a little trouble throwing it deeper in counts, and and he's spraying it a little bit. He's gotten onto the barrel a little bit to both sides of the plate here. North of 30% hard count. It's not a super worrying number or anything, 31% in aggregate, but it's fine. Um, so I really want to get to some Hunter Brown here tonight. I think he's... I think the projection is probably about fine. I think the ownership's too low, given how high that number is. Uh, I know that we got Gosman and another guy that we'll get to in the next game, next couple of games. But I, I think this number's too low. I think the strike strike one rate is fine. That's really the only number that kind of jumps out at me um, that could see some improvement. Yeah, it's the, the plate discipline here in aggregate, but it's not like he's walking people. still throwing it past him, right? Suppression metrics have been great. He's given up some average, though, to the right-handers, and that's why I say he's getting on the barrel here a little bit. But it's look at the ground ball to fly ball ratio and 115 hitters, 330. Ground ball to fly ball to the left side, or to the right side, excuse me. It's some line drives that he's giving up. But this is Oakland. I'm not playing any of them tonight on a full 12-gamer. Uh, I'll probably have some Seth Brown uh, for sure because I, I play him pretty much against every righty in baseball. Um, but... Outside of that, I mean, Asturia Ruiz is okay if you want to play some of this righty line drive narrative here. Uh, I think that's fine. He's 3,200 now. He'll get on. He'll steal. So those are really the only guys that I want to play. Maybe a short stack with a, a Brent Rooker. But outside of that, I don't really want to go after them. All these all these guys just strike out too damn much. I really like Hunter Brown here tonight. James Caprillion on the mound for the A's. Can't play him either. He's walking the whole country. He's not striking anybody out. Now, he's generally kind of hard to stack against in Oakland in particular because he gives up fly balls, um, but it hasn't really been with so much hard contact that that it's over the wall. But look at these numbers. This They had to move into the bullpen because he's walking so many people, and he's got a 43.5% aggregate hard contact rate that's the second highest number in baseball for anybody that's started like more than four games um it's not so much on the barrel but i don't really care (laughs) you know like the barrel rate is actually a little bit lower than it has been in the last couple of years um you know but still aggregate hard contact rates uh are, are very concerning here translating to a full two homers per nine um, it's noisy to the lefties, yeah, three and a half per, but uh, he's he's always given up power and always given up production, so I think we can certainly stack. And I'm not worried about like Oakland or um, you know some of these lefties hitting the ball 
over the wall in Oakland. It, like we're talking about Kyle Tucker and Jordan Alvarez. You know what I mean? So we'll see if they get Josie Altuve back tonight. He should be. He's a very playable 5,200. I like Bregman not so much at 52, but it's okay to play in stacks if you want to get there. Josie Abreu stinks. He's at 29. I don't want to play him in a full 12 game slate at 2,900. Um, at first base, don't really want to do that. Jeremy Payne is still expensive, 48. So the, it's the price tags that make it expensive to get to and, and hard to get to full stacks here because you definitely want to play Jordan and you definitely want to play Kyle Tucker at 6,000 and 5,600 respectively and definitely Jose Altuve. So it's probably just short stacks due to the pricing, but if you can make full five bands happen or four mans even, yeah, go after it. Um, I got no problems with this whatsoever, so uh, no Oakland pretty much at all outside of that, you know, off-the-board short stack. Just as a little bit of coverage against my very likely heavy, heavy ownership on Hunter Brown tonight. Uh, okay, let's move on. Boston and Arizona. Chris Sale at 9,000. He's one of these guys in this 9K range. Again, I think you can land on here tonight. High projection and attainable ownership. I, I don't think there's anything super exploitable in either of these numbers here. Um, I wish the price tag were a little bit cheaper, but all of the underlying metrics look fantastic for sale so far, the full nine starts. Um, I think some numbers, you're probably going to see some positive regression for him, to be quite honest. He's got a 5 ERA with expected metrics in the mid threes here, run and a half lower. Strand rate's probably going to come there. 67%, you'll probably see this drift up, given that the strikeout stuff is there for sale. Uh, he's given up some pop, a little bit to the right side, and, you know, 31% hard contact rate in aggregate, you know, whatever. Super noisy sample against the lefties, but everything has been very encouraging for Sale. Um, I think he's starting to get, now that he's healthy, his last four starts have been fantastic, and really five of his last six. Did I have a clunker in the middle against Baltimore there where he didn't strike out anybody? Um, I'm sure we remember that game. Gave up five runs in five innings, but he, he's gone six and a third, six, eight, and seven in his subsequent four starts at 5Ks, 10Ks, 9Ks, 8Ks in some pretty difficult matchups, Philly, St. Louis, San Diego, and Cleveland. So I think this is very playable here at 9,000, even though this matchup against the D-backs, I don't generally like going after them. They're pretty average nearly everywhere, 34% hard contact. And they'll get the baseball on the line a little bit, but they hit a lot of ground balls too. Buck 60 ground ball to fly ball. Now the righties could get to sale here a little bit because he is a fly ball lean against the right side still. I don't want to touch a lefty against him. Uh, it would be only righties that hit the baseball on the line and that, or in the air, and that's really like a Christian Walker uh, or in a Manny, a Manny Rivera, something like that. Lord Gurriel is okay. Um, or an Evan Longoria. But I don't want to go out of my way to be stacking against Chris Sale here. I think there's a lot of good upside for him um, to suppress a good bit of contact. So I think this is a pretty decent play here tonight. All of the underlying plate discipline numbers look fantastic. This is the old Chris Sale really starting to emerge in the metrics here. And just because he's got a 5-0 ERA, I don't, I don't really care about that. Uh, everything else looks really, really good so far. Um, very encouraging and and. To, you know, to see him healthy. Brandon Fott on the mound. He's been struggling. Uh, he had four of his, or th I guess three of his first four starts at the bigs have not been all that equitable. He had one where he survived five innings against the Giants, but everything else uh, has not been great. He's had two kind of difficult-ish matchups against Texas and Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh, not so much you know, in the difficulty, but he still gave up three runs, only struck out three. So I'm not sure the strikeout stuff for him has really started to show up just yet. And I don't want to deal with that against Boston. Very good team uh, against left-handed pitching. And, and we are frozen here in the sheet. There we go. Um, very good team against left-handed pitching or against right-handed pitching, excuse me. 20% um, strikeout rate. Above average WRC+, plus, even though you'd like to see them create a little bit more, they're still going to hit for some power. These are still good numbers. Neutral ground ball to fly ball, give or take, uh, with a 19% line driver. It's like to see this a little bit higher. Uh, but they hit the baseball in the air at a pretty decent clip, and when they do, it kind of goes over the wall. 13.5% hover to fly ball rate is a pretty good number in aggregate for a team. 32% hard is a pretty good number as well. like to see the walk rate tick up a little bit more. But these guys make a lot of contact, and against somebody that's somebody that's not going to throw it past them, 
58% strike one, he's going to have a little bit of susceptibility in putting them on base for free. Just a 16% aggregate K rate. I think it's a very attackable spot for Boston. I'm going to play them again, and I'm going to smash my head on the wall again when they don't get there again. Uh, but we're just going to do it. Um, so here we go. Give me Sale. Give me Boston. I'm less on the D-backs tonight outside of maybe some real line drive and fly ball hitters like in Evan Longoria, Christian Walker type, Manny Rivera maybe. Um, so mostly off of the D-backs. I like Boston here a little bit. They're three to two in the betting markets, so you got to stomach that there. But I think it's uh, pretty playable, pretty pretty much around, um, across the board in DFS. All right, last game of the game of the night here. Um, let's get to Mitch Keller, who I really want to play, and George Kirby, who I kind of really want to play also. Um, ten one for Keller. He's seeing a third of the ownership of Kevin Gosman, and this is the pivot up in the ten K range that you want to get to. Uh, he has been absolutely incredible. It's a full 180 transformation. I I went on a little bit of a, uh, a drool fest about Mitch Keller in his last start, and it's all excellent, man. Like, he's had two bad starts this season, and, and you know, one of those was in a really, really bad matchup against St. Louis. The other was his first start of the year against Cincinnati, where he gave up four runs. Uh, but the strikeout stuff is is there. The walk. Look at this walk rate from Mitch Keller. This is just like totally mind-boggling. A complete transformation from him. And it's the fastball mix here. It's so balanced. Really getting a lot of value out of the two-seamer and trusting it. The only downside here is the slider and the changeup value. Not throwing the change a lot, but when he starts to trust this pitch too, it's it's like oh man. The top three arsenal in baseball. It's just so, so good, top to bottom. Huge called strike rate, so we don't necessarily need as much chase out of him. But the strike one rate is there. He's establishing, and he's working to his secondary pitches. Um, I think it, I think everything's great here. I want to play some Mitch Keller once again against the Mariners. I think this offense stinks. Um, they are outrageously frustrating to play and frustrating to watch, even though Ty France finally hit two balls out last night. Uh, Teoscar Hernandez has been terrible. Everybody else has really been terrible. Also, Julio has been largely terrible. Um, the, they got J.P. Crawford leading off still. Uh, you know, like Kelnick has been their one sort of bright light this season. But Gino, did, as with Cal Raleigh, but like. Julio can't get on base to steal. You know, he's been super frustrating. Ty France, outside of last night, he's been awful all season. Gino is awful. Um, and the guy's down at the bottom of the lineup. I mean, Josie Caballero's been okay. Taylor Trammell's been, you know, fine. But he's Taylor Trammell. He's going to regress back to being Taylor Trammell. So I don't really want to play Seattle. I don't want to go near them. I love Mitch Keller in this spot. Uh, I, I really think there's a lot of upside. 25% aggregate K rate. I think Mitch Keller could pop for 35 and 40 tonight. Um, he could throw another complete game here. Now, this may make me look really stupid, but I'm going to get a boatload of Mitch Keller, and he's my preferred pivot off of Gosman, even though there's a three and four point lower projection. When we get up to these very high numbers here, there's a lot of variance in that. And even though Gosman's got a very good matchup, um, I, I still want to play a lot of Mitch Keller here. I love everything that he's done, and the market still hasn't totally acknowledged it yet and i think there's exploitability in this very low ownership figure i think this should be at least twice this in this particular spot so i want to play a lot of him george kirby for the mariners yeah we play him too i'm less bullish on him because he just pitches to so much contact the strikeout rate because he throws so many strikes look at this walk rate 2.2 percent in a 58 and in a third sample here like it's, it's kind of short still but um, this is sustainable because he throws 72% strike one rate is out of control. It's so good. He throws so many strikes that it makes it hard for him to just strike guys out. Um, you know, the, the stuff isn't like super o overwhelming. It's location and it's sequencing that makes Kirby so elite. So I want to play him too. I think 20% ownership in this 9k range is very attackable, both with him and sale. I think they're the best plays in this range. Yeah, I want to play Hunter Brown, and I want to play Mitch Keller. Those are my pivots up up top off of Gosman. But I think I'll probably be eating a good bit of this ownership on Sale and Kirby here in this range. 
um, at the at the nine Ks. Maybe I'll get some Jesus Luzardo or something. But uh, I want to play Kirby as well. I think it's a very tackable spot for Pittsburgh against righties. They've cooled off significantly. Maybe heating up a little bit, at, um, you know, in the last couple of weeks or so. But still, just 91 WRC plus here. Sub 150 ISO, 31% hard contact rate. It's okay. Neutral ground ball to fly ball rate. It's okay. High walk rate, yeah, but Kirby's not going to walk them, right? And they're not going to strike out a whole hell of a lot. So that takes me off of Kirby just a little bit. So I'd rather get to probably a sale because his strikeout upside is, is that much higher. Um, so that's, if I had to guess, when I start building teams, that's how I'll come in. But uh, I like getting to him because I, I love this arm, man. He, he throws so many strikes and he stays off of the barrel, stays down in the strike zone. And it does not give up production. I, I I love both of the arms in this game. I don't want offense pretty much at all. Maybe if you want to play some late slate, late slate shenanigans with like a Reynolds, Sawinski, I don't know, G1 Bay or Tuki Marcano or Josh Palacios or something from the left side, sure. That's okay. Um, you know, but I, I don't want any Seattle whatsoever. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and get as much Mitch Keller here as I can tonight. Uh, I, I really like this spot a lot. Okay, so that's the breakdown. Um, we went kind of long here, so let's quickly go over some some stack targets for us uh, and do a quick review. San Diego and the Yankees. Musgrove, I think, is playable here at 7,500 tonight uh, against Yankees. Do um, you want to target some, some Musgrove? There's variance with him still, and he's really uh, not quite gotten it going just yet. So I think that's playable. Um, Randy Vasquez, no thank you. Uh, we're definitely going to want to get to some San Diego. They'll be popular, and they're expensive for the guys you want to play. Uh, but you could play cheaper Matt Carpenter, Rugi Odor in, um, you know, in their revenge narratives or, you know, whatever the hell you want. Uh, Texas, Baltimore. I want to get some offense here, too. Texas, I think, is very sneaky. Grayson Rodriguez, I would love to play this kid, but he's having trouble getting there with the fastball. Um, so I don't think he's quite ready just yet for the full prime time against elite offenses like Texas. I think you can target Baltimore as well and, and go after some John Gray. He's been much better in his last three starts, but he's still having trouble spotting the four-seamer, and you can go after that um, with a pretty okay change-up, but historically, you know, he's had trouble with left-handers. Uh, a lot of lefties here at playable price tags for Baltimore. St. Louis and Cleveland, no pitching here for me because Bieber, even though I love him, I, there's three, four other guys I'd rather play in the range. He just doesn't have the K stuff anymore. Um, so you could play St. Louis in that in that respect. You know, still a very hot offense and a guy that's pitching to just an 18% K rate and, uh, what, 78% contact rate, I think. It's very high for Bieber. I don't want any any Libertor. I guess if you want to play correlated stacks, like, sure, because Cleveland is dreadful. Um you know, but it's just kind of a suppression matchup. He's kind of a contact pitcher, too. Philly and Atlanta, I want offense here. Maybe some Jared Schuster targeting some Philly stacks because the middle of their lineup is really not all that great against left-handed pitching outside of Harper and Trey Turner. Um, but give me a good bit of Atlanta here against Taiwan Walker. I think this is a very tackable spot for the Braves. San Francisco and Milwaukee. I don't want any San Francisco, really. Um, but you can attack a... Kind of concerning rising walk rate against Philly or against uh, Freddie rather. His his walk rate is, like this is a problem again, and he's given up a little bit of pop. So you can play some very cheap and off the board like short San Francisco stacks. I don't think this is horrible. Um, so maybe I will get to some San Francisco. I'll probably still get to some Milwaukee as well. I think targeting some Alex Wood. I don't think he's very good. Number one, um, and I'm still waiting, still waiting for Milwaukee's right-handers to get off the shine a little bit against lefties. Toronto and Minnesota, I want some Toronto, definitely. I don't really want anything to do with Minnesota tonight, including Louis Varlin. Um, Gosman, yeah, but I think I'm going to come off of a little bit of the Gosman and get to some Mitch Keller down here and some Hunter Brown for sure. Uh, Washington and KC, offense only. A lot of Washington, I think. I'm less so on, on Kansas City. They're playable because they make a lot of hard contact against lefties, and Corbin's not going to strike him out. But uh, mostly Washington here for me, I think. Mets for sure. You just got to balance the ownership. Maybe a couple of Scherzer pieces. I don't know. But I don't think he's all that all that right just yet. Uh, some Colorado pieces, yeah, because Scherzer's a fly ball pitcher at Coors Field. Let's go. Uh, but no Connor Seabold, absolutely not. Miami and the Angels. Offense is sneaky here. Short stacks, definitely, because you got two pretty good arms. I don't know how Reed Detmers is good, but he just he is. Um, 
So give me a couple of these righties over here. I like uh, Jonathan Davis, 2,500. That's a pretty decent punt outfield play uh, in deep tournaments tonight. Georgie Soler, yeah, for sure. And and Birdie is, is good, too. Uh, and some of the Angels, if you want to go after some right-handed susceptibility for Jesus Luzardo, I think that's is okay, too. If you want to play some Luzardo, I think he has strikeout upside in this 9K range to still get through this lineup. Houston and Oakland. Houston exclusively for me tonight. Um, maybe a, a short Oakland stack on the late slate or something. I'll have some Seth Brown, yeah. Um, but that's that's pretty much it. Maybe in Asteria Ruiz because Hunter Brown's getting on the barrel a little bit to the righties, but that's pretty much it. Boston and Arizona. Sale and Boston pretty much exclusively for me here tonight. Maybe a couple of one-off Arizona fly ball and line drive hitters against Sale. But no Brandon Fott here tonight. Uh, I think it's a pretty good spot for Boston. Pittsburgh and Seattle, pitching only. I like Kirby, but I really, really like Bitch Keller. So uh, that's where I am, I think, so far for the first look, guys. Uh, hope that helps while we're building teams on this big 12-game main slate tonight. Once again, keep an eye out for projection and ownership updates. These, these things will change throughout the day. So uh, we'll have pushes as lineups start to roll in. So good luck, everybody, and we'll catch you uh, tomorrow for a likely split Saturday slate. Good luck.